Good morning. It is so great to be together on Sunday morning with the Lord's people. Uh, we always enjoy this privilege once a week, so we are excited to be here. I want to welcome everybody here, whether you're a regular attender or a visitor. We want to tell you that we are glad that you are here this morning. Members, if you would uh, check in and visitors, there's the code behind me. Uh, if you could pull out your iPhone, scan that, and we would love to have a record of your attendance. If you don't have an iPhone, that's okay. There's some cards in the pew in front of you. Uh, you can fill one of those out and just leave it in the pew, and we will pick it up after service. Services. Um, we do have quite a few traveling this week for spring break uh, for Williamson County, so we need to keep all of those in our prayers. Uh, and on our prayer list specifically, we want to mention a couple of folks who need to continue to remember John Rutledge and the things that he's got going on, so make sure that you continue to remember him. Also want to uh, be mindful that Bob Graber is going to be undergoing knee surgery on March 16th, so we also want to be mindful of him. And there's several others on our prayer list, so if you would, just grab a bulletin and check those out at your convenience. I do want to remind everybody that there is no uh, little leaders tonight. Uh, Adam and his wife are out of town, so he wanted me to make mention of that. Uh, we ask that you continue to be uh, cautious as you're going through the foyer out here. Uh, if you're not aware, we're kind of going through renovation. So if you're visiting with us wondering what in the world happened, I uh, know we didn't get wind damage. We're actually just renovating the auditorium. So uh, we would appreciate if you would just be a little bit more careful as you're going in and out uh, as we're going through this renovation process. The ladies' prayer group will meet today at 5 p.m. in classroom 212, just up here to my left. Um, if you have any questions, you can see Miss Leanne Stubblefield or Miss Jane Thomas. Those are all the announcements I have. If you would stand and let's continue to join in song. True hearted, wholehearted, faithful, and loyal.
where Charlie Vance leads us in prayer, we'll sing, My Jesus As Thou Wilt. Let us try to put all the distractions out of our mind and let us talk to the Lord. Let us bow our heads and pray. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us all acknowledge your presence not only in this worship service, but in all of our daily activities. Lord, please forgive our selfish ways and choices that dishonor you. Let us all be thankful for the Bible, the only book that is the true word of God. Help us to do righteous deeds of comforting and serving those who need help. Lord, help us to not only consider those less fortunate, but be able to help them as well. Give us wisdom to deal with helping them to understand the plan of salvation that is explained in God's holy word in the New Testament. Please, dear Lord, give us the courage and boldness to embrace the challenges of this period we are living in and stay Christ-centered. Let us trust in your love knowing that you're always there for us no matter what we encounter each day. 
We pray we will reflect on Christ's sacrifice for us and help us to realize our limitations and seek your help and guidance in all things. Guide us to use our talents wisely to the glory of God. Jesus, please, please let us be aware of the privilege to always be able to pray to you, knowing that you are always there and hear our prayers. Encourage each person to take time each day to pray. God, we know that we have Jesus sitting at your right hand, preparing a place and interceding for us, and we're grateful for that. As we continue to face life's challenges and difficulties in this present world, let us not lose our faith, but be persistent and endure, knowing that your will is to be done. Father, please enter the hearts of the unbelievers that they may come to know you. We are grateful for our beliefs, although help us with our unbelief. Please let us always continue to pray for wisdom and good responsible decisions from our elders. We are grateful and pray for our deacons, ministers, and staff for the excellent work that they do. We are very thankful for the many volunteers who sacrifice so much to keep our Bible classes and other events on track. We want to pray for our political leaders now and in the upcoming future that the decisions they will be making will be in accordance with your will. I pray that with their leadership, we will be more faithful to the United States, looking to God, who is our ultimate leader. We pray that the United States will be a more God-freeing nation. Please continue to be with those of our church family who are sick. We think of John Rutledge and Mr. Garber. Pray for them especially. Pray for our shut-ins, praying they, they will, as others, be able to watch our worship service through today's technology and live a better and more healthy life. Thank you, dear Lord, for sending your only son to die for us so we might live in you. I pray, dear Lord, that we, as we take our last breath on earth, we will be in paradise and spend our eternity in heaven. Dear Lord, we are so grateful for your patience your mercy, and your gift of grace to us as believers in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. In a moment, Carl Heggie will uh, preside over our Lord's Supper for us, and then before that we'll sing, Jesus, Thy Name I Love.
The whole church comes together every Sunday. Why do we do that? Well, we can name many reasons. We do many things when we come together, but is there a prime reason, a primary object, the main event, so to speak, that we come together every Sunday? Well, I think Luke answers this <clears throat> in his writing in Acts 20. He's with Paul on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. And this was the reason that they met on Sunday, every Sunday, the first day of the week. Clear reference to the Lord's Supper. The prime object, the prime event, every first day of the week. But what is the result, the outcome for us on that assembly every first day of the week. What does the Bible say? <clears throat> Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. What is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble, and he's referring to the whole church in 1 Corinthians 14, the whole church, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation, there are many things happening. Let all things be done for edification, or building up. The Hebrew writer put it this way. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together as a habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Paul wrote this to the Colossians about congregational singing. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, think, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So we have different words here describing the edification that is to come to us, the edification, the encouragement, the stimulation. This is the outcome, the outcome that God wills for us. So what do we have when the whole church assembles? The main object, to break bread, and the main outcome for us, edification. So in the mind of God, is the Lord's Supper the major contributor to our edification in this assembly? Paul had this to say about the Lord's Supper to the Corinthians. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And he calls it the cup of blessing. Why does he call it the cup of blessing? Your head is spinning, isn't it? We are sharers in Christ, he reminds. We are one family, united. We all share in Christ together. And then he wrote this, very familiar. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A clear proclamation that he who was dead is now alive and will return. That's encouraging. That's edification. We have the same expectation that we will be raised. That's hope. So many things edify, but the Lord's Supper, I believe, from Scripture, is the primary object, the primary event of our meeting every Lord's Day. And so at this time, when you bow your head, your mind should be full of things that you are thankful for and you will be built up. Let's pray. 
Father, we're thankful as we partake of this bread, for we remember that by his stripes we are healed, and we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray again. Father, as we partake of this cup of blessing, may we remember that our sins are forgiven, put away by his blood. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Our giving is another important event. 
every first day of the week. You can give online, box in the back, over here. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful <clears throat> for the gift of giving because that also builds us up for we know the promise that when we give, we are laying up treasure in heaven. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me as we sing on Zion's glorious summit. Remain standing as Shane Austin brings our scripture reading. In preparation for the message of the hour, I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. 
I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who I assume against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. It is great to be here, and it is great to see all of you here. And if you happen to be visiting with us today, thank you so much for coming our way. We are always encouraged by your presence. We hope that you'll be edified. We hope that you'll be encouraged. We hope that you'll want to come back and be with us anytime that you have an opportunity. Well, before we get started this morning, it is my pleasure to introduce a couple of folks who want to be a part of this church family. That is always a delight for me. First of all, Natalie Hoyt. Natalie, where she is right back here, one of our young professionals. We are so glad to have you, Natalie, as a part of our church family. Thank you so very much. If you haven't got to meet this young lady yet, you'll want to do that. Also, Donna Warren. Donna, where are you this morning? Are you here? There she is. She's right in front of Natalie. And so many of you know Donna. That, of course, is Lisa Grissom's mom. And uh, she, for many years, her and her husband were at Southern Hills, where he was an elder for about 22 years or so. He passed away back in 2019. And we're glad to have her as a part of our church family. And I know Lisa is excited to have you sitting next to her in church on the Lord's Day. Well, before we get started, before we pick up our lessons in 2 Corinthians, as we always do, let's ask God to bless our time together. Father, we are so very thankful. What a joy it is to be here. What a joy it is to be among your people. What a joy it is to be able to open your word and contemplate these things you brought to us through your spirit. We are asking for a blessing as always. We want to understand your will better, and Father, we pray that you'll find in our hearts an eagerness to bring all of these things that you reveal to us into our lives, to transform our lives, and to shape our lives into your character and into your will. And so it's in Jesus we ask this, and we say, Amen. And if you brought your Bibles, would you please hold your Bibles up this morning? Thank you very much. If you want to follow along, and I hope that you will, you'll want to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the text that Shane just read for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Listen, so far so good. I don't see anyone asleep yet except for Scott McFarlane. Uh, Man, I know that hour hour today is, you know, I'm always... uh, a napper on Sunday. Well, today uh, it's going to be an extra long one, I think. Uh, But uh, this is the one Sunday I'm going to give you a pass. And so uh, I will not call you out if I see you fall asleep, except you, Kevin. If you fall asleep, you're on the front row, you're doomed. I'm calling you out. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you've been with us Uh, Since we started this study several weeks ago, uh, you know that up to this point uh, in this great letter, Paul's words have generally been pretty gracious. Uh, They have uh, been pretty conciliatory as far as kind of a general approach to his writing goes. They've been pretty gentle. But now we're starting the last part of the letter of 2 Corinthians. It starts here in chapter 10. It's going to go through chapter 13, the end of the book. And we're going to see an abrupt change in his words. Uh, The gentleness, the graciousness, the conciliatory tone that has generally characterized his writing up to this point 
is going to change. Now his words are going to become far more authoritative. They are going to be stronger. Some would say, rightly so, that they become very confrontational words. Uh, they just, it's just a different way of, uh, of writing, uh, confrontive, uh, some would say. And so because you see this abrupt change in the nature of his writing, you have to ask the question, well, what's up with that? And there are a couple of approaches to it. There are a few people who actually say, wow, it's so different than uh, chapters 10 through chapter 13. That must be a part of a different letter. Uh, uh, Paul, we know, wrote multiple letters. A couple of them we don't even have. By God's design, we have what we have. Uh, but some of those that he wrote to the church at Corinth that we don't have, it, it has to be a part of one of those. And somehow over time, it would just kind of merge together. Those who hold to that view, they haven't been persuasive as far as I'm concerned in terms of their explanation. Most people believe as I do. No, this is a part of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is everything that we have here, chapter 1 all the way through chapter 13. So what is going on beginning at chapter 10? Well, he gets back on defense in chapter 10. Now, what does that mean? Well, again, for those of you who've been here, you, you know what I'm talking about. But for the benefit, especially for those who haven't been here, 2 Corinthians is really written about uh, the reason, the purpose, the occasion, if you will, behind Paul's writing this is to defend himself. When Paul left the church at Corinth, some people have come there, they presented themselves as apostles, and they are trying to take over. They want the platform that Paul had. They want to teach their destructive doctrines. Now, in order to seize that platform, they're going to have to undermine Paul, and they're going to have to do everything that they can to destroy Paul in the eyes of the church at Corinth. And so they just go on the attack. They've attacked his character. They've attacked everything about Paul. Uh, they're, they're, again, trying to present themselves as the real apostles, even though they're false apostles. Now, we've seen some of Paul's defense up to this point. And we know in chapter 7 that Paul was really anxious about the situation. He's been pretty tough on the church at Corinth. He's wrote him a severe letter that we don't have. He sent Titus to them to see how things, how they're responding Titus comes back in chapter 7 and has great news. The church at Corinth has responded positively to Paul. And they have opened their arms to Paul. Those who have distanced themselves from Paul, they have re-embraced Paul. The relationship that was strained has now been restored. And then we get into chapter 8 and 9. After the restoration of that relationship in chapter 7... What Paul does in 8 and 9 is he takes that time to exhort them uh, to keep a financial commitment that they made earlier, a commitment to help hurting saints in Jerusalem. So that's been the last two chapters. Now we come to chapter 10, and he's back on defense. He's going to be dealing again with some of the charges that are being made against him. And as he does that here in the first six verses of chapter 10... I think there are a couple of things that we need to look at very closely. A couple of things that are very relevant to us. I think Paul is going to model two, two very, very important things for us as Christians. Let's take a look at it. <clears throat> so when he begins here in chapter 10... <clears throat> He says, now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. Now, when he says this, uh, we're encountering one of the charges that his opponents are making about him. When he says here in verse 1, again, he says, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold to you when absent. Paul's not saying that. Paul's not saying that's how I am. That's a charge that these, uh, these rivals of his are making. They're saying about Paul, 
look, we can prove that he's not really an apostle. We're the real apostles. When he's with you, he's so gentle. He's so compassionate when he's with you. But boy, when he's away from you and he's riding, and when there's a lot of distance between you and him, boy, he's as fierce as a lion. He can just be tough. He can crack the whip. But boy, when he gets face to face, suddenly his spine goes away. He's just weak. He's a wimp is what he is. No apostle is really a wimp. If you're going to be an apostle, you got to carry the whip at all times. you got to use the whip. And you got to bring people into submission with the whip. So that's how we are. And so this is an accusation they're making. Now, we know that because look what he says later on, a few verses later in verse 10. For they say, that's his rivals, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. So this is something that they're saying. Now, the first thing that we're going to see Paul model here that's relevant to us is this, that we need to keep in mind. The first lesson is we need to walk humbly. In other words, we need to remember to be like Christ. Now, watch what he says again in verse 1. He says, I urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. In other words, he's saying, don't let my demeanor toward you when we're in person. Don't think for one minute that because I have been so patient with you, because I have been so gentle with you, don't think that just because I haven't tried to beat you into submission, don't take that as being weak. Don't take that as being spineless. Don't think that means that I'm not bold. The reason I am that way is because Jesus Christ is that way. The reason I am that way, the reason I have been so patient to you, the reason I am so gentle with you, the reason I seek to persuade you to the right conduct rather than to drag you into the right conduct, is because Jesus sets the example. Now that's something we all have to remember. And Peter, uh, Paul rather here exemplifies it beautifully. Even when he's facing tough times, even when the situation is so strained, uh, he still, to the, to, to the point that he can do this, he still... Has, exercises extreme patience and deep compassion. You know, it reminds me of what he's going to tell the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2. We're so familiar with it, but it's this little statement in verse 5 of chapter 2 of Philippians. Have this attitude in you which is also in Christ Jesus. That, that's how we're to be. We have to imitate the attitude and we have to imitate the behavior of Christ. And Paul says, that's what I'm doing. And that's how Christ is. When we think about Christ and we think about some of the words that would describe Christ, one of those words that Jesus uses himself is the word meek. It is the word gentle. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When Jesus was interacting with people, there was not bitterness there, there was not anger there, there was not resentment there, there was not a desire for revenge there. He was very patient. That is the nature of Christ. Now sometimes, and it was this way even with Paul, sometimes that, that patience would reach a point to where you had to get a little more confrontive. But that wasn't always the first place to go. The rod for Jesus wasn't the first place. Persuasion 
was the first place. You know, when Paul thinks about his own life and relationship to Jesus, he thinks about Jesus' patience. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says, Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Jesus was patient. Paul says, that's why I've been patient. That's why I've been gentle. And that's what we've got to do. As we are dealing with people and we are promoting the gospel and the kingdom and the agenda of God, we have to walk humbly. You know, sometimes there are some people who mean extremely well, but they are just on what I would call a truth trip. Now, when I say that, I am not in any way minimizing the pursuit of truth. You know that. (laughs) I've been here for 14 years. You know that. But I'm talking about people who they just, you know, they, they seem to be poised. And the minute they find someone that is outside of the truth, they just give them the horns. You know, you mess with the bull, you're going to get the horns. And there's just not an approach of gentleness there. There's not a, a, an approach that seeks to persuade Sometimes it is an attempt to almost beat someone into submission. That's never productive. That doesn't work. That doesn't honor God. It doesn't reflect the character of God. Now, we got to stand up for the truth. And we can't be ashamed of the truth. We've got to honor the truth. We've got to promote the truth. But we need to do so as Christ did. And that is... The rod's not the first place we go. Persuasion is the first place we go. And that's what you see in Paul's life. Paul says, again, he just reminds them, I'm walking gentle, I'm walking meek, because I'm following the example of Jesus. But don't think for a minute that I'm not ready to go to war if I have to. And that's what he says. Go back to 2 Corinthians, take a look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 He says in verse 2, I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence which I propose to be courageous against some. (laughs) Listen, in other words, listen, don't act in such a way that I'm going to have to get tougher. He doesn't want to get that way. That's not the first place he's going to go. The first place he's going to go is he's going to be like Jesus. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to seek to persuade you with reason. But if there comes a moment that he has to get tough, then he's, or, or he's going to get tough. So first of all, as we think about Paul here and we are, uh, are watching him in his behavior toward the Corinthians, this is the first thing that I'm impressed by here in chapter 10. And the first thing that I think about that is really applicable to me. Now, that brings us to the second thing. Let's take a look at it. The second thing that we're going to see is this. While we walk humbly, while we remember to be like Christ, while we practice patience, while we practice compassion, while we we try to exemplify a gentleness, we must also fight tenaciously. In other words... We don't just remember that we're to be like Christ, but we're also to remember we're at war. And Paul remembered he was at war. He never forgot the fact that he was at war. Watch the language of Paul. Watch the the language of warfare, the metaphors that he uses. Look at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the fle- of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Boy... That is, langu- that is strong language. And we need to remember this. 
we're at war and God expects us and we have to fight tenaciously. Now, it's not a physical war. We know that. Now, look at the end of verse 2. Uh, he says, that, that's what we just read, where he basically says to them, look, don't act in such a way that I have to get tough when I come. I don't want to do that. I want to I keep it gentle. I want to be patient. But so, so think about that. And then he says, um, who regard us, he's talking about some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. That's a second charge that Paul's rivals are making against him. He walks according to the flesh. Now, of course, when they say that, they're using it in the moral sense. Uh, he's driven by the impulses of the flesh. Well, what Paul does, he turns around in verse 3, and he uses it as a play on words. And he goes, yeah, I'm in the flesh, but he doesn't use it in a moral sense. He uses it in the sense of, yeah, I'm flesh and blood. I'm just a man, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. I am physical, but the warfare that we are involved in, it is not physical. And so he says in verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. And he goes, and I, and I love this imagery here, what we need, he says, is powerful weapons for the destruction of fortresses, for the destruction of strongholds. You know, uh, back in August, Leola and I took our first trip uh, overseas since COVID started, and, and we, we went to Wales. And, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's, uh, it's you know, it's not very big, but there are more medieval castles per square mile in Wales than any other place. And that's because it goes back to the 13th century. There was an English king. His name was Edward I. He was known by the, by the name Longshanks. The reason he was called Longshanks is he was incredibly tall for being 13th century. You know, people in the 13th century weren't very big. But Longshanks stood ahead above everyone else. He was six foot two, which is ginormous in the year, you know, 1272. And so he was called Longshanks. Maybe you've seen the movie Braveheart and, and William Wallace and his arch nemesis at the beginning of the movie was Edward I, Longshanks. That's who it was. He built all those castles in Wales because he was determined that he was going to bring those pesky Welsh to heel. And so he just ringed the country with it. It was called a ring of iron and stone. And you can go over there today and, and you can go to these castles. And they're just, they're just amazing places. So when I, we were over there, we went to so many of these castles. And, 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 and I bought a book while I was over there. Uh, it's called How to Attack a Castle and Defend It. And uh, so listen, if you, I just want you to know if you ever find yourself and you have to storm a castle, give me a call. I, listen, I've got the knowledge. I've got the blueprints. Uh, we can talk about, you know, the best. We can talk about the siege machines. I've got the blueprints. We could design one. We, we could talk about mining. All of the, all of the tactics to, to storm a castle, to take a fortress. But I don't think you're going to really be attacking any fortresses but we do know how to we need to know how to attack a fortress we do need to know how to besiege a stronghold not a physical stronghold but we need to know how to besiege a spiritual stronghold now what is a spiritual stronghold well he tells us right here take a look at it he says in verse 5, at the end of verse 4, he says, but we need divinely powerful weapons for the destruction of fortresses. And then he says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. That's the key. That's the fortress. Those are the fortresses that we are besieging. Those are the fortresses that we have to storm. These are the fortresses that God calls us as soldiers of Christ to attack. 
These are speculations that are against the knowledge of God. In other words, the fortresses that we are to storm are ideologies. Ideologies that are opposed to God's character and revealed will. It is every human thought. It is every human worldview. It is every human theory. It is every human plan. It is every human explanation that is opposed to the will of God. That's what he says here. These are the fortresses that we are called to destroy, that we are called to besiege. We, we are called, in other words, to have this direct confrontation with the ideologies that are seeking to undermine the truth. You're a soldier of Christ. That's the implication here. Listen, there are no exemptions. If you belong to Christ, you're a soldier of Christ. There are no deferrals, not in Christ's army. You have to confront the ideologies of the day. We are in a war. We are in a battle. Paul uses the language of spiritual warfare. He talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, of course, in verse 12, we won't go there, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against all the demonic hordes. Now listen, let me say this about our battle with demons, okay? Because there's a lot of information out there floating around on spiritual warfare. Our battle is against demons in one respect. One respect. But not in a common way that some people think. Some people think our battle against demons is that we are directly involved against demons. No. Mm -mm. We We are not directly involved against demons. That idea for us is foreign to Scripture. Now, demons are behind what we're battling, but we're not battling the demons personally and individually. We're battling the ideologies that have arisen from the bowels of hell. I, I remember, I, listen, I was once, I remember, I remember, I was actually at a Christian college once, and, and it was like during a lectureship, and, um, you know, they have, you, you, there are a lot of people there with, with booths and, and things like that. And I remember this one guy, and I went up to him because he was all about spiritual warfare, and I wanted to, you know, see what he had out there. And he had, the, and he had like these, uh, the, these theories in our, about our battles with demons. And, and he was like selling to people these like tent stakes, and they like had Bible verses on it. And, and in order to protect ourselves from the demons, that, you know, we can put those stakes around our house or around our church buildings. And I thought, man, are you serious? Or where did you get... I wanted... I didn't say that because I'm trying to be like Christ. <laughs> I'm trying to be patient and gentle. <laughs> uh, but I thought, what the, those are pagan ideas that, that demons are out there and if we you know, drive a stake with a Bible verse, it's going to keep that demon. It's going to like make a force field. That's not biblical idea. Our, our enemy, our direct enemy, isn't demons. They're the ultimate cause of everything that we're fighting against. But what we're fighting against is ideologies, speculations that battle and oppose the very knowledge of God. We're not called to convert demons. We're called to convert sinners. That's who we're called to convert. We're called to bring people captive. They're thinking captive to the truth of God. Look at what Paul says there in verse 5. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's what we're doing. That's how we warfare. That's how we engage in war. That's how we fight. We are fighting for the minds of people. People's minds are being taken captive by godless ideas and notions. And we've got to be prepared for that fight. You know, when I think about it, ultimately, one of the fortresses that we face in Western culture 
One of the ideologies, one of the speculations that oppose the knowledge of God is naturalism. Naturalism. That's the idea that nature is a closed system. There's nothing outside of nature. So there is no God because God would be outside of nature, supernatural. Now, there is no supernatural. Nature is a closed system. And we are a part of that closed system. Matter is all there is. Death is complete extinction. And so since matter is a closed system, since nature is a closed system, and that there is no God, then we shouldn't use concepts like God bring those things into public policy. We shouldn't bring things like God who doesn't exist because nature is a closed system. We shouldn't bring ideas like God into our sex lives. We shouldn't bring God into anything. That, that's what those are the fortresses that we are battling. And we've got to fight tenaciously. Listen, don't forget the second part. Don't just, there's a lot of people who like the first part. Walk humbly, be like Christ. And by the way, they use that as an excuse to do nothing. To do nothing. When we talk about being patient and gentle with people, some people go, well, oh, I'm being like Christ. I do nothing. I say nothing. I do nothing. I just let it all go. No, no, no. Paul, did, Paul was like Christ, but he, it's not that he did nothing. He's writing the church at Corinth. He's sending Titus on a mission to Corinth. Uh, Paul is, is very much uh, you know, active. He's not passive. Being gentle doesn't mean passive. And Paul's that way. But listen, we've got to remember, while we're walking like Christ, while we're trying to be humble, while we're trying to be patient, do not for one second fail to realize that we are at war and we have to storm fortresses. Now, since it is a spiritual battle, since the ideologies are those fortresses, Paul says we have to have powerful weapons. Look at that again where he says that. He says, verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful. Well, what weapons do we need? Let's get a little bit practical here. What weapons do we need? Well... He doesn't tell us here what weapons that we need. But don't worry. It's clearly implied. Because, again, the fortresses are ideologies. The fortresses are ideas that are opposed to the knowledge and the will of God. And so when it comes to weapons that, that try to bring people's thinking captive to Christ, there is only one weapon... And that is the truth. That is the word of God. This is the weapon. You know, when we think about this, and we think about Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, where we have the armor of God, and we're reminded there that we're at war again, and pull on the full armor of God. In, in, in the whole armor of God, there is one offensive weapon. There is one. And that one offensive weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That is the weapon. That is the only thing that exposes lies. It is the only thing that exposes speculations that are opposed to the knowledge of God. The only thing that does it, the only thing that corrects these lies are the truth. And this is the key. Listen, so the key to being successful in fighting tenaciously, the key... Know the Word. That's the key. you got to know the Word. If you don't know the Word, you cannot attack successfully the castle. You can't attack the fortress of speculations that are opposed to the knowledge of God. You can't bring captives that are inside that fortress into the thinking of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't do it. If you don't know the truth, the only thing that is effective against the lies of the world is the sword of the Spirit. And so it is absolutely impossible to do this task of fighting tenaciously without constantly studying Scripture. You know, 
as we think about the early assemblies and what we see in, in the Bible about first century assemblies, Carl was so right this morning in pointing out the central focus of our time together. As we are called together on the Lord's Day, this weekly anniversary of resurrection, to remember by eating that bread and drinking that cup that it is because of Jesus that we have a relationship with Him. It is because of Jesus that we are, are free of condemnation. It is because He went to the cross on our behalf and we are acknowledging it and we are proclaiming it that it is not because of my heroic deeds that I stand before God in the clear. It is because of the heroic actions of, of Jesus Christ. That's our central focus. But at the same time, we also recognize that a central feature of God's people when they came together was that the Word was... They were going to sit under the teaching of the Word. The Word was constantly being preached. It was constantly being read. That's why Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to instruction. That's why he would say later in the second epistle to him, preach the Word uh, that's why when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and, and we see this assembly, even though it's so chaotic there, we see the important features. You have a word of instruction. Uh, you know, is among the many things there. Let all things be done for edification. And that's why Paul says, no, only one person can speak at a time. That has to be as the word is being revealed. People have to understand. That's why we spend so much time in the word. Well, why, why do we spend so much time in the word? Why do we come together on a Sunday morning and spend so much time in the Word? Why do we come together on Sunday evening and spend time in the Word? Why do we come together on Wednesday? Why do we call it Bible study and spend so much time in the Word? Why are we about to adjourn here in just a few minutes and go to our Bible classes and spend time in the Word? Because it's only the Word. That is the only weapon powerful enough to take down the fortresses of Satan. It is the only weapon that is going to successfully deliver people from the captivity to sin and bring them into captivity to Jesus Christ. Paul exemplifies so beautifully here what we need to always remember. As we watch him defend himself, he is giving us lessons that are timeless. As we relate to people, let's not forget, walk humbly, always be like Christ. But also, don't forget, we are at war and fight tenaciously. Battle is absolutely unavoidable. We have to fight for the truth with the same determination that Paul fought for it. Let's pray. Father, as we think about our battle this morning, we just pray that we will be more determined than ever to engage in the fight. Father, help us to be mindful of our responsibility to storm the strongholds of Satan. Help us to understand always what those are, that those are ideas that take people captive. Father, we want to be prepared for this battle we want to fight tenaciously in it. I pray that everyone here will, will recognize the importance of studying your word and that we will all have a renewed determination to not only study it on our own, but to avail ourselves of all of these times that the elders have given us a structured place to do it and a structured time. Father, help us to be like Paul. As we fight, may we never forget, though, that we're to be like Christ. Help us to walk humbly. Help us to be gentle. Help us to be patient. But, Father, never let us forget that we are to be soldiers of yours. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, as we close this morning, we close as we always do, and that is with an invitation of Jesus Christ. If you're not in the battle, it's time to begin. It's time to join the army of Jesus Christ. If you realize where you're at outside of Christ, then you know that you need to be in Christ because it is only in Christ that you find the redemption that you so desperately need. 
And so we invite you to come to Christ, confess Him as the risen Lord, surrender yourself to Him. The Bible calls that repentance. And then be baptized into His name. Uh, It's there that God has promised to meet you as you're immersed into the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that He's going to meet you and you're going to enter into a relationship with God there, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you haven't done that, we encourage that this morning. If you've done that, but maybe you have wandered away, if you have fallen victim to some of the ideologies of the world, and you have, even though you're here this morning, you've drifted away in your mind and heart, and hopefully something that we have said this morning has made you decide, I need to get back to where I need to be and God wants me to be. And I hope uh, you'll act on that. If you need to do it in a public way, we want to encourage that because we want to pray with you, we want to pray for you. And so if you have a spiritual need that you need to take care of this morning, do it right now while together we stand and while we sing. Day and, and participating so greatly in this worship period, and we thank God for giving us the opportunity to worship Him in this manner. Uh, we'll sing uh, Will You Not Tell It Today, and then Ron Gamble will lead us in our closing prayer. And uh, please stay around for our classes to follow. with me please father we're so grateful for the opportunity that we had to be here today we're grateful for the lesson that Dan brought 
And Father, we are challenged every day by ideologies that are not from you. And we do not need to be fearful. We need to be gentle, yet we need to be strong. We need to understand your word and to live with your word. And it will carry us through. Father, as we meet the challenges of the day, the other thing we need to remember is we never stand in, against challenges alone. You are always there with us. You encourage us. You strengthen us. Father, without you or nothing, but with you we can handle anything. Father, thank you for this time of this service. We pray that we will be totally acceptable in your sight. And we're grateful for the opportunity we now have to go to classes where we can learn more of your word so that we may be strong in serving you. Bless each person that is here today. Bless us and may we come back together again this evening. We look forward to that day we can be with you. And thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's through his blessed name that we pray. Amen.